Plants vs. Zombies is a game about strategy. It's about analyzing a situation, devising a plan to tackle it, and acting accordingly. But what would happen if you couldn't do that first step? Would the game still be playable? Or would you be doomed to lose over and over again, hoping to just get lucky while swinging in the dark? Today, I'll be answering that question by putting an extraordinary amount of cloth on my face to obscure my vision as much as possible, and attempting to beat the entirety of Plants vs. Zombies while blindfolded. But first, some preparation is required. After all, even though this is one of my favorite childhood games, playing it blind isn't just gonna come to me naturally. The main issue is nailing down controls. This game is generally played on a computer with a mouse, but doing so is probably not the greatest option for us, as pressing a button or item that we can't see using a cursor that we can't see isn't really feasible. Because of this, I decided to forego using a mouse and instead play with a controller on the Xbox version of this game, which is way more optimal for playing blind. Not only does this garbage general purpose cursor get replaced by the much more attractive full tile cursor that is much easier easier to manage with their eyes closed, but things like sun, plants, and coins, which are all crucial to the game, actually magnetize towards your cursor in this version without you having to know exactly where they are on screen, making our lives that much simpler. So with our controls set up and my mental preparation complete, it's finally time to answer the question. Is it possible to beat Plants vs. Zombies blindfolded? The first couple day levels here act primarily as tutorials, which is fitting since it's during these where we'll have to learn some strategies that make these levels possible blind, and how we're actually going to execute those strategies. The first level is luckily only focused on that second one, as it only has one lane to defend and is straight up impossible to lose even if you try. Zombies only start to spawn after you plant at least two of these pea shooters, which are pretty good in this challenge. They're cheap to plant, and unlike me, they're actually allowed to see, so they'll automatically attack any boys that walk onto their lane. So since no strategy is required, all we gotta do is prove to the game that we're able to collect sun and plant plants. That first one's actually a little more annoying than you may expect. Sun is only automatically collected if your cursor is within a two-tile distance from it, and both where and when sun spawns from the sky is almost entirely random, and therefore impossible to determine blind. This means that our best option for accumulating this stuff is constantly scanning the top of the screen with our cursor and listening for this sound which indicates that we've collected some sun. Of course, we actually have to put that sun to some use, which is where that second mechanic comes in. The only real difficulty with placing plants is determining where your cursor is on screen so you can actually put them where you want them. Since I have to constantly be moving the cursor to scan for sun though, I usually have to do this by first normalizing its position, which just means holding a direction for long enough to know that I'm in one of the corners, and then counting out D-pad presses in order to get it in the right spot. From there, I just have to remember where on the grid I've placed all my plants, which is easily the thing that I improved upon the most as the challenge Went on. But for now, with the two basic concepts of execution nailed down and our first zombies killed, we move on to our first real level, where we got multiple lanes to deal with. This introduces one of the main obstacles of this challenge, I don't know where the zombies are, which is especially troubling in the beginning of levels when we don't have enough sun to defend all of our lanes equally. So now we'll actually have to start strategizing. Okay, so beyond pool splashing, which only comes later, there are no natural audio cues that indicate which lane a zombie is in. So we'll have to create our own unique audio cues by planting some boys. Pea shooters are an easy way to do this. If we plant one in a lane and hear peas being shot, then we know where the zombie is. But if we hear zombie noises with no peas being shot, then we know where the zombie isn't. However, since we'll never have enough sun in the beginning of a level to cover more than just one lane with a pea shooter, this really only solves half of our problem. But that's where the second plant that we just got comes into play, the sunflower. Sunflowers are already the most important plant in the game, but they're even better in the context of this challenge. Although extra sun production is their primary use, we can also use sunflowers as sacrifices to locate zombies. Upon starting the level, I'd place one of my first sunflowers way to the right of the lawn, and then wait for this super subtle sound cue that indicates that the first zombie spawned. Here, try and listen for it. The zombies are coming. If I hear munching sound effects soon after this, then I know he's eating my sacrificial sunflower and place a pea shooter on lane one. And if I don't hear anything, lane two. And if after all that and there's still no munching or pea shooting sounds, then I know that he must be in lane three, which I can just defend with a lawnmower. Once that first zombie is dealt with then, I can then take some time to build up enough sun to defend all three lanes with pea shooters, at which point it doesn't really matter where the zombies spawn, allowing us to breeze by level one two in my first attempt with only one little flowchart. We get the cherry bomb as a reward, which 
can actually be pretty good at clearing zombies if I know the general area they're in, but since he instantly explodes when I plant him, he's kinda hard to use with no visual cues for timing. If anything, getting the cherry bomb only made my life harder, because now I gotta deal with yet another big problem in this challenge, getting lost in my plants. Unlike the main cursor, I can't normalize the position of this plant cursor, it just cycles through if I keep tapping one direction. This means that we have to always keep track of which plant we're currently selecting, and making a mistake or forgetting literally ever can be completely disorienting. Are you kidding me? Why can't I place a sunflower there? Am I selecting a cherry bomb again? Uh, I don't know what was going on, I'm not gonna lie to you. There was a cherry bomb. Okay, so now I, I see my issue. Luckily, with only three plants to keep track of, it's not too bad for now, and the strats that worked for 1-2 work just fine in 1-3. However, level 1-4 is where things start to get real. First off, walnuts are garbage. Though they're cheap, their long recharge time and lack of attacking power generally make them a complete waste of sun. And secondly, we got more lawn to deal with. With five lanes to defend, the flowchart of using a sacrificial sunflower and pea shooter at the beginning no longer guarantees that we'll know the position of that first zombie, as it leaves open three potential lanes that he could be on if he isn't in the first two. So what was my strategy? Luck, just pure luck. I didn't figure anything out until like two levels from now. But before we got to that point, we had to get through level one five the first minigame level, and these are pretty concerning, as they often change game mechanics in ways that are just simply not blind person friendly. But before we're even allowed to play it, we're forced to use the new tool that we just got our hands on, the shovel. Now getting past this part isn't hard or anything, it just requires that I try and shovel literally every single tile, but I did find a pretty useful technique here. You usually have to hold the B button to fully shovel a plant, but if you just tap the B button while hovering over a plant, it'll make this shovel noise which helped me find where these guys were on the lawn. I very creatively called this shovel tapping. And believe it or not, this technique actually sees a ton of use in a lot of later levels for whenever I forget where I put my plants. But that won't help us now, cause we got some bowling to do. Rather than having to buy plants with sun, this level gives us either walnuts or explodo nuts on a conveyor belt, which both act as instant use plants that bowl over zombies. Like I mentioned when we got the cherry bomb, instants are all about timing, which makes them real bad when they're all we have, cause now there's no good way of locating zombies. And if we can't locate zombies, most most of our limited supply of walnuts is gonna be tossed into the void and completely wasted, which we can't really afford to do. So to combat this, I developed an incredibly advanced technique that will allow us to maximize the utility of each and every walnut we receive, waiting. Waves of zombies generally spawn after half of the previous wave's health is depleted, which is known to the speedrunning community as the 50% rule. However, if too much time passes before that happens, waves will instead automatically spawn after that certain amount of time. So if we just sit there for a while, enough zombies will spawn such that every lane will be almost guaranteed to have some zombies in it, at which point we can just attack every lane with all the walnuts we've built up in that time to hopefully completely clear the screen. But how did I know when to do this full screen attack? Well, since I can't see or hear when I'm about to lose to the zombies, I instead had to find a couple specific points in the song that plays in the background that indicate both when my conveyor belt is full of walnuts and when zombies are near the left of my lawn, which I could use as an audio cue. <laughs> There we go. However, this strategy isn't foolproof. I can only ever build up enough walnuts in my conveyor belt to attack every lane twice at a time. So if I'm ever expected to attack a lane three times, then they'll be able to sneak through. Luckily, I can actually use this to my advantage, as lawnmowers don't just clear a lane, but they also ensure that no zombies will spawn on that lane for a couple waves after. So since I heard some lawnmowers go off right before the final wave, I was able to find out which lanes got destroyed by figuring out which lanes didn't have zombies. No one's in that lane. No one's in that lane. And from there, I could focus my attention on just three lanes, which is much more manageable than all five, allowing me to clear this fifth level and move on. After that, we got our hands on the potato mine, and this guy's pretty all right. Although we can occasionally get a kill if I just randomly toss out enough of them, his main use is in the beginning of most levels, as a super low cost and unique sound effect allows us to cover one additional lane for that first zombie. This is especially nice as it creates a 50-50 for the first lawnmower if he's not in one of the top three lanes, which is way easier to deal with than a one in three, since I can plant a sunflower in one of the lanes to exactly determine which one goes off if it comes down to that, revitalizing our perfect first zombie flowchart. So with this new addition to our 
roster, 1-6 here became a perfect example of exactly how a blindfolded level should look with our current strategies. That being said, 1-7 here is the perfect example of exactly how a blindfolded level should not look, as it's basically a miracle that I made it out of here alive. It started with a mistake that I made right at the beginning, when I misplaced the sunflower one column ahead of where I intended. I would later mistake this sunflower for a pea shooter while setting up my defense, which made me think that this lane was much safer than it actually was. Luckily, when this came back to bite me later on, I was able to react fast enough to the rampant munching sounds and placed a panicked cherry bomb in the general area to take care of it. A strategy that makes you look like a genius when it works, and an idiot when it doesn't. Anyway, this destruction of my lane led to a streak of bad luck, as a pull vaulter spawned there before I was able to fully rebuild it, and once I realized this as he jumped over my defense, I couldn't save it, because my cherry bomb was still on cooldown from the last time this happened, so I had to lose a lawnmower. While rebuilding this lane, I planted a potato mine to cover any more pull vaulters that might spawn here, but I must have instantly forgot that I did that because I didn't ever switch back and spent the next full minute thinking that I was planting pea shooters and being confused as to why I couldn't place that many. Eventually though, I managed to figure it out. What in the world? I did not think I placed this many potato mines. Hold on. Was I on a completely different plant than I thought I was? The entire time? Anyway, while that nonsense was happening, yet another pull vaulter decided to spawn on my weak lane and jump over my only defense, which should have absolutely destroyed me. But now that I managed to find my way back to my pea shooters, I got the idea to try and place plants in my back line to figure out which of my lanes was eaten, which just so happened to save my life. But as I was concerned with reinforcing what I now knew was my weakest lane, an absolutely insane twist of bad and good luck was occurring on a completely different lane. A conehead and pull vaulter both spawned on the lane whose lawnmower I sacrificed to the first zombie, which is just the perfect combination of things to straight up kill me. But for some reason, incomprehensible to the human mind, I decided to scan my backline again, which shouldn't have done anything because I have sunflowers back there. But it just so happened to be the case that the lane that I needed to defend immediately was also the lane that I forgot to put a sunflower in at the very beginning, allowing me to place another miracle pea shooter without even knowing it. From there though, I had a general idea of what was going on, and all I had to do was not make any more mistakes. I thought that was a cherry bomb, are you kidding me? What did I just put down? Now, truth be told, this level absolutely wouldn't have been such a disaster if I had just used the snow peas that I got in 1.6. But because I'm a big blind idiot, I forgot the order that you receive plants and thought that this guy was a chomper, which is especially apparent now that I have to choose the plants that I want before each level. This is a pretty bad mistake to make because snow peas are absolutely some of the best plants in this challenge, and chompers are, uh, not. This didn't stop me, however, from accidentally starting up a chomper column in 1-8 and not realizing it until halfway through the level. But through complete luck and nothing else, I still managed to survive the level regardless and remedy my error in 1-9 by actually planting snow peas this time. Although I could have also used repeaters here, snow peas massively outclass them in this challenge, for although they technically have less DPS, their slowing effect almost completely makes up for it. And besides, killing zombies slower is actually a good thing for us, as it gives us more time to accumulate sun to plant even more snow peas. So long as you can cover each lane with at least one of these guys, then you're pretty much golden for the entire rest of the level. Which is something I wish I realized before literally the last normal day level. But before we're allowed to move on to the night levels, we first have to pay the toll that is 110. This is the first real conveyor level, and if accidentally selecting the wrong plant at some point in a normal level is an issue, then receiving completely random plants throughout the entirety of a level is a major issue. There is no way to tell what plant I have selected. Heck, there's usually not even a way to tell what it is even after I've planted it, unless I plant a cherry bomb, but that's never particularly useful information. Because of this, the only semblance of strategy that I could apply here was what I called printer strats, and I never came up with a better name for it, so that's what we're going with. This strat effectively just involves constantly mashing the A button to plant guys as soon as I get them, which is really pleasant on the ears, and ensuring that every single tile at least has A plant on it by moving my cursor like it's a printer. Besides that, there were a couple other things I did, like keeping track of which columns were full and occasionally waiting to store up enough plants to maybe get a cherry bomb sometimes, but let's all be honest with ourselves, I just mashed buttons and got lucky. Compared to the conveyor levels to come, this one was absolutely no threat. But with that, it was time for the night levels. There are five sections in this game, and each one slightly changes the mechanics in ways that are supposed to make the game harder, but actually tend to work in our favor, hilariously enough. And night levels are no exception. The primary selling point here is that sun no longer falls from the sky, but this just means that we don't have to do nearly as much sun scanning, and as a result, we're not gonna lose as much sun as we did in the day levels. Not that we're gonna need sun anyway, because holy Christ, puff shrooms are unfathomable in this game. These guys cost literally nothing, recharge immediately, 
immediately and do the same DPS as pea shooters. They're so unbelievably overpowered that we don't even need to worry about locating the first zombie anymore. We straight up have enough time to defend every single lane with puff shrooms before he becomes a threat. This makes night levels much less about strategy and flowcharting and much more about execution and memory. Memory is actually the easy part. I'm generally pretty good at memory type games, despite what some previous gameplay clips may imply, and I only got better at keeping track of what my lawn looked like as the challenge went on. Having good execution on the other hand is actually really hard. I don't know if my controller's just bad, but it's way easier than you'd expect to accidentally press a diagonal on the d-pad when you're trying to move in a cardinal direction. This can very often lead to misplanting, which really throws a wrench in the whole memory thing, because it's impossible to tell that I've made a human error until I start noticing the consequences. Luckily, being forced to plant a million puff shrooms every level gave me plenty of practice, and these guys are so busted it doesn't matter if I make a couple mistakes here and there. Seriously, have I mentioned that these guys are pretty good? I, I feel like I'm underselling them a bit here. Oh yeah, also sun shrooms are obviously pretty good too, but oh my goodness I can't get enough of these dudes. The only thing about them that you could even call a weakness is that these guys usually aren't powerful enough to take down zombies with higher health, like football zombies. If I could see, then I'd just kill them with a stronger plant, but since there's no great way to tell which lane he's on, the only way to do this would be to put strong plants on all my lanes equally, which just isn't feasible when we're getting less sun than before. So I instead decided to invest even further in quantity of plants rather than quality, which was only enabled when I unlocked fume shrooms. These guys are great, although their stats don't really do the best job of showing this. I guess its attack kills screen door zombies and hits multiple guys simultaneously, but they're mainly good for the same reason as puff shrooms. They're fast and cheap. So much so, to the point where, after I'm done planting my sun boys, I can pretty much constantly alternate between planting a fume shroom in my back line and a puff shroom in my front line for the entire rest of the level to completely flood the screen. I mean, yeah, sometimes plants are gonna get eaten and even overwhelmed, but I can rebuild so fast that it doesn't even matter if I lose a lane. Not only did I not have to see, but I didn't even have to think, making the first half of the night levels a cakewalk. Although it's also worth mentioning that this is around the part of the game where money is introduced, which is pretty interesting in this challenge. At first, it just serves to increase your number of seat slots, which will definitely come in handy once we start using a wider variety of plants, but there are also a couple of absolutely necessary items that we'll need to buy in the shop later down the line. Collecting coins works just like sun, but unlike sun, I'm not constantly scanning for it, so a lot more is lost over the course of the game. Instead, I got most of my money through lawnmowers, which turn into coins at the end of every level, and diamonds, which luckily have a very obvious sound cue. One, two, three. Is that just a straight up diamond? Nice. So much like every other mechanic introduced in the night levels, this one really didn't make my life any harder in the slightest. That all changed, however, once we reached 2-5, whack -a zombie Probably the most unique minigame level in the entire game, this thing only gives us three plants and very inconsistent sun, meaning we're gonna have to rely on getting our own hands dirty and whacking zombies with our trusty mallet. Ah, here's the issue though, I'm still blind, and with no reliable access to any useful plants to locate zombies, this boils down my strategy for this level to just swinging in the dark, which just consists of constantly scanning every lane, mashing the absolute heck out of my X button, and praying to the Lord. There were a couple other things that I did to make my life a little easier, but there's really nothing too special. Of the plants we have access to, you'd usually just use a bunch of grave busters, but these guys are pretty garbage in this challenge. The only way I can even locate a grave to remove it is by either somehow realizing that I can't put a plant there when I I should be able to, or just mashing on completely random tiles while I have a Grave Buster selected, both of which take up too much time in a level that requires my constant attention. Instead, I mostly used Potato Mines, as I could just randomly place them wherever and whenever to occasionally get a kill, which is better than nothing. I also occasionally made use of Cherry Bombs during Big Waves, as the overabundance of Graves, which I don't know how that happened, can absolutely overwhelm me, even if I'm mashing as fast as humanly possible. But with enough perseverance, luck, mashing, and pausing to get all the lactic acid out of my arm, it is in fact possible to just barely eke this one out. Yes, yes, oh my god. <laughs> oh, whoops, I, I think I accidentally kicked something. Once I got past the only hard night level, I got another couple mushrooms that never did anything, a level I forgot to record, and a couple more levels that I didn't forget to record, but still easily fell to my Pushroom army and Fume Shroom militia. Not only that, but the last two night levels also granted us access to two of the best instants in the entire game, as they don't require us to see anything. The Ice Shroom freezes every zombie on screen regardless of where I plant it, and Doom Shrooms are, well similarly useful. We were cruising through these normal levels, with really no strategy even. 
That was, however, until 2.10. The second conveyor level, which required even less strategy. Not because it was easy, mind you, it's just because th there are so many things that make this level way worse than the last one, so there's really close to nothing we can consciously do. Just looking at the selection of possible plants that we have in these levels, we can see that not only do we just have less attacking plants overall, but they're also not as good. As their primary benefits come from low sun cost and fast recharge, neither of which are factors when they're being delivered via conveyor belt. Instead, we get more instants, which are more opportunities opportunities to completely waste plants in our backline, and the worst thing known to man, the god dang Grey Buster again. I already explained why using these guys is more trouble than it's worth, but them being forced into our hands makes them actively bad for us. The only way I can tell that I even have one of these guys is first knowing that the tile I'm selecting is empty, which is already pretty hard, for although shovel tapping can tell me if there's a plant there, there's no way to tell if there's a crater or a grave, which is just something I had to deal with. Once I found a clean tile, I would just mash my plant button to put a guy there, and if a suspicious amount of time passed with without anything happening, then I knew I probably had a Grave Buster and couldn't put him down. Cool, so now that I've spent an insane amount of time and resources just figuring out that I have one, how do I get rid of them? I could try and switch plants, but if that doesn't work, then I don't know if it's because the next plant is also a Grave Buster, or if it's because I didn't have a second plant available and I just reselected the first guy again. In other words, switching plants gives me negative information. So instead, I resorted to randomly mashing on tiles in the middle of the lawn to hopefully find a grave to put them on, which oftentimes inadvertently placed actual useful plants in the middle of no man's land, but that's a sacrifice I just had to endure. Apart from that, however, there really wasn't much else that I could do, so a lot of this level boiled down to pressing completely random buttons like like a child and eventually getting lucky. Getting through that nightmare rewarded us with lily pads, which I guess are necessary or whatever, but they get minus points on the tier list because I don't like them. Or more accurately, I don't like what they represent. The pool levels. First off, we're back to daytime, which means a new and improved circular sun scanning is gonna have to come into effect. But more unfortunately, all of our mushrooms enter the snooze zone. Dang it. Now we can't just mindlessly spam a million plants like we've been doing, and we gotta go back to using our brains. However, the fact that mushrooms sleep during the day doesn't make them entirely useless for us, as they can still help to upgrade that first zombie flowchart that we'll have to dust off. Specifically, rather than spending 50 sun and a recharge on a sacrificial sunflower, we can instead use a free snoozing puff shroom to serve the exact same effect with no downsides. I mean, I guess it uses up a seed slot, but I don't, I don't care, I'm only using snow peas anyway. Speaking of that flowchart, I should probably mention how else it changes now that there's a massive pool in the middle of our lawn. You might think that this makes things harder for us, as the addition of the pool means we're defending six lanes instead of five, two of which are extra expensive thanks to the need for lily pads and inability to use potato mines. But much like how the night mechanics backfired in the game, this actually makes things easier for us. Zombies don't start spawning in the pool until several waves into the level, and when they do, we can hear it loud and clear. This means that our beginning flowchart actually only has to deal with four lanes, and since we can cover one with a buff shroom, one with a potato mine, one with a pea shooter, and one with a lawnmower, there is no longer any variance with the first zombie. I can always pinpoint his exact location immediately, and it's very satisfying. In fact, the pool doesn't just help with simplifying our first zombie flowchart, it actually just makes things easier across the board. Generally speaking, not being able to see makes our best strategy to defend every lane equally. But since the pool waves are so delayed, I can partition my focus between between the two different parts of the lawn at different times to distribute the same amount of resources over a smaller number of lanes, improving our defense. Now if that made no sense, uh, don't worry, I'll explain it in a hopefully better way for a strat that I needed for 3-5. But before we get there, we've got some more pool levels to mow through. These things introduce three new plants and one new zombie, so let's take a look at this side to start. Three Peters sound cool for this challenge because they cover three lanes, but they're too expensive to use during the part of the level where they'd actually be useful. Squash is incredible, but I didn't realize that until way later, so let's just put them on the back burner for now, which leaves us with just Tangle Kelp, which is another actively bad plan. It's not really his fault, I mean he kills zombies which is pretty cool, but he sucks because one of the best uses of lily pads, which is finding where I am in my plants. If I ever get lost and forget what plant I'm selecting, then I can just cycle through them while selecting a water tile. And if I only have one aquatic plant, then being able to place it immediately tells me which plant I'm on. This doesn't quite work if I have two aquatic plants, and this guy's just a little more important, so uh… Unfortunately, none of these guys help with the new zombie of this section, the snorkel dude, which is the first zombie type that will actually have to directly counter by implementing some new strategy. Their main gimmick is to hide underwater in the pool lanes, and they can really only be damaged if they're out and about while eating a plant. The only consistent strat that I could think of to deal with these guys was to place a couple walnuts in the pool that can make them vulnerable. I guess this technically means that walnuts aren't actually trashed here, but trust me, they're still not too far off. Especially considering that once we were able to deal with those first couple pool levels, we come across what is easily the hardest level so far. 
Little zombies, big problems. Except it's not actually the zombies that are the problem, it's the dang plants. Apparently, whoever made this game ran out of interesting ideas for minigame levels at this point in development, because this one's just another conveyor level except with some small zombies. Not only that, but the plants that are given to us are just abysmal. Pea shooters are the only acceptable ones we get. Aside from them, we get walnuts, whose stock is only gonna go down from this point on because they can't deal damage, cherry bombs, which are almost always just gonna explode in my backline since I can't ever tell when I get them, and lily pads, which are mostly just formality, but are also insanely annoying in a conveyor belt level for similar reasons to the grave busters. So yeah, one good plant in a level with six lanes to defend ain't a great thing to see. And if it wasn't obvious from this background footage, our regular printer strats aren't even close to cutting it for this one, unless we get lucky enough to literally never receive walnuts. So what's our plan here then? Pool cleaners. I got to the shop and prayed that I had enough money for pool cleaners. I lost way too many runs to not having pool cleaners. But aside from that, it was about time to go all in on a little strat that I like to call partitioning. And maybe instead of a rushed, half-baked explanation, what you guys need is some numbers. Here's the deal. We receive plants from the conveyor belt at a constant rate of around one plant every four seconds. Assuming that each plant has the same chance of appearing, which appears to be the case from what I can tell, this means that we can expect one pea shooter to be given every 16 seconds, and those are the guys we need. The issue with this is that the first zombie that spawns is gonna reach the end of the yard only 50 seconds from when the level begins, at which point we can only reasonably expect to have three pea shooters available, which is just not enough to defend six lanes. But like I tried to explain during the previous pool levels, since zombies don't start spawning in the pool for a while, in this case after 45 seconds, we can partition the lawn into the pool lanes and the land lanes, and initially just focus on the four land lanes and then switch our focus to the pool lanes later, which doesn't stretch our resources nearly as thin. However, three is also smaller than four, meaning we'd still have to get lucky enough to receive an abnormal amount of pea shooters just to defend the first couple of waves. So let's partition even more. The top lanes are area one, the bottom lanes are area two, and the pool is just the pool. If we initially ignore area two in the beginning and let our lawnmowers take care of it, then we can pour all of our focus into just one area at a time. And now that we're only attacking two lanes, the likelihood that we get at least one pea shooter on each lane, if not two, skyrockets. And if we get a particularly magical attempt like this one, that's blessed with more pea shooters than we could ever ask for, then we wouldn't have to worry about area one for the entire rest of the level, lessening our load immensely. So how do we continue a start like this? Well, let's get further into it. Because we're hard focusing on area one in the beginning, we kill all of the zombies up here very quickly. And due to the 50% rule that I mentioned earlier, this spawns waves fast enough such that all of the zombies before the first flag are out before the bottom two lawnmowers get activated. So we don't have to worry about area two in the slightest until we hear the huge wave sound effect. We do have to deal with the pool at this point though, which can be an issue. Getting lucky with the pea shooters at the start necessarily means that we don't get as many lily pads as we may need, which puts a hard limit on how many plants we can put in the pool. In this particular attempt, I got a little unlucky, only being able to place four plants in the pool, three of which ended up being walnuts. However, this luck ended up turning around very soon after, as not killing these guys stalled out the first flag long enough to not only set up some pea shooters in area two, but also get this to happen. That cherry bomb was huge. It didn't just kill the zombies that were about to kill me, but it also gave me much needed information about the pool lanes, specifically the fact that it's the bottom pool lane that doesn't have a pea shooter. So at this point, my main strategy consisted of putting all my resources into area two, favoring the top lane to potentially get lucky with cherry bombs and occasionally putting plants in my bottom pool lane whenever I got lily pads. I completely ignored area one and the top pool lane, for at this point, I was confident that they were well protected. However, I was wrong. Area 1 was fine, but the level decided to put a thousand snorkel zombies in my top pool lane, which eventually overwhelmed the two plants that I put up there, activating my pool cleaner and initiating the final wave. I was immediately able to tell that it was my top pool lane that lost its pool cleaner because I was able to put a lily pad in its back line, indicating that all the plants on that lane had died. This meant that this was the only lane in danger of losing me the level, for Area 2 was completely decked out at this point, and even if Area 1 or the bottom pool lane were shaky, they still had their lawnmowers and pool cleaner respectively, so there was nothing to worry about with them. One lane was all I had left to defend. But since this pool cleaner went off right before the final wave, shouldn't that mean that no zombies will spawn in this lane? Well, not quite. Dang it. But despite this, I still got insanely lucky and received just the right combination of plants to quickly defend from these ambush zombies, finally finishing off the most intense level thus far. Of course, I didn't know that at the time. This snorkel zombie was taking a suspiciously long time to kill, so I was still fully in panic mode. Where am I? What am I doing? Okay, um, I can't imagine he's anywhere but the pool. One of my pool cleaners went off. 
but one of my pool cleaners went off like right before the big wave. It's possible I don't need to do anything. I go in the top right. I'm going to play something. Uh, I'm going to try and find a lily pad. Come on. <gasps> anyway, with that behemoth of a level behind us, it's time to get back into the normal levels. 3-6 introduces Zombonies, which just suck. They have a ton of health, instantly kill plants, move extra fast, aren't affected by the snow peas slowing effect, and spawn these dweebs if they last too long. However, there's one good thing about these guys that makes them manageable. Their unique sound cue that triggers as soon as they spawn that we can react to by using instants. Oh, I found them. The game expects us to deal with them with jalapenos, but these guys only attack one lane, so we got a 25% chance of that ever working out. So instead, I opted to tackle them with cherry bombs, which have a much more promising 50% chance of taking care of them. Luckily, we only had to deal with two of these guys in 3-6 before we got our hands on the spike weed, which is the real Zomboni counter. These guys chill on the ground where they can't be eaten and do small amounts of passive damage, but their real utility comes in the form of instantly killing Zombonies, which is obviously a pretty good thing for us. Pop it. Yeah, that's right. Idiot. It's also worth mentioning that it's at this point where I replaced the potato mine in my first zombie flowchart with a squash, as he not only can play the same role, but he's also just much more versatile in the later parts of levels. I would get both of them if I could, but we're at the point where we need all the free seed slots we can get in order to make room for the specific zombie counters we've been needing recently. But after planting a million spike weeds and bypassing 3-7, it was time to get introduced to yet another problem zombie, the Dolphin Rider. These guys are basically just cracked out pool versions of pole vaulters, which are incredibly annoying to deal with. A pretty good counter for these guys would be the tall nut, which I thought that I unlocked after that last level. But I instead got Torchwoods, which are not only not good counters, but they're also just bad plans for us, as they directly clash with our snow pea strategy. Eventually I caught my mistake, at which point I switched back to using Walnuts and dealt with the Dolphin Riders by simply placing them much further ahead in the pool. Once I beat the level and actually got Tall Nuts though, Walnuts got completely phased out and are right back into the bottom tier where they belong. 3-9 wasn't anything new so much as it was a gauntlet of everything we've been doing in all the other levels. It's not particularly interesting to explain, but it's a great singular level that showcases a ton of what this challenge is all about. So if you just want to watch it with my live commentary, this is probably a good time to mention that you can watch all of my successful attempts at these levels, alongside abridged versions of all my failed attempts, on my second channel. Although I'll warn you now, any and all videos on that channel are going to suffer from a significantly lower standard of quality. So, uh, Watch out for that, I guess. Anyway, with the last of the normal pool levels complete, we got yet another conveyor belt level to suffer through. Although this time, it's not nearly as bad. We get way more actually good plants, mainly three peters, and don't have to deal with anywhere near the same number of zombies, which makes things much simpler for us. That being said though, I still had to use partitioning, as there are a couple things that make this level extra annoying compared to 3-5. First off, we get Tangle Kill, and like I already said, there's no way to distinguish between these guys and lily pads when I plant them, meaning I never have a clue as to where I can and can't place things in the pool, which ain't too great. And secondly, although there aren't as many zombies in this level, there are much stronger zombies. And unlike normal levels, there's no way to consciously counter these guys when I hear them come in, because I don't know what plants I got. This can lead to situations such as, oh, I don't know, a zomboni spawning on an area that you've decided to ignore, creating an ice path that allows a billion bobsled guys to spawn and completely destroy the lane, at which point the lawnmower for some reason just decides not to make a sound effect, giving you absolutely no indication that you are in any danger until the moment you lose the level. No, dude. Oh, I thought I was doing fine. Yeah, things like that can just happen sometimes. Luckily, these things weren't bad enough to make this level anywhere near as bad as 3-5. So, with a lucky enough start, a healthy amount of swiping lanes, and an unhealthy amount of button mashing, we were able to conquer the pool levels and move on to the penultimate area, the fog levels. These things are just pool levels, but at night. So you know what that means. The shrooms are back in the game, baby. Oh yeah, there's also fog, I guess, which uh, obscures our vision which is, you know, pretty big problem. All right, I'm not gonna sugarcoat it. These were the easiest levels in this challenge by far. I'm sure the day and night levels were technically easier, but I had improved so much since then. And these things were much less chaotic than the daytime pool levels. That being said though, we still had to switch up our strats a bit from level to level, so it wasn't completely brainless. The first two levels saw the return of puff shrooms and fume shrooms, although I also incorporated a new plant, the sea shroom, which is just a water puff shroom with a super long recharge time for some reason. We also got plant turns after that first level, which are actually surprisingly bottom tier. Yeah, obviously. 
previously. Things were going pretty swimmingly until 4-3, which introduced balloon zombies, yet another type of zombie that we have to directly counter, or else they'll just fly over all my defense and kill me. The game initially gives us the cactus to do this, which pops their balloons, but setting up a cactus on every single lane to deal with the very minimal balloon zombies that are going to come my way is just simply too expensive to care about. So instead, I just let the first guy die by my lawnmowers, and I killed the second one using a doom shroom, which is just something you're going to have to trust me on. Beating this level awarded me with the blover, which is going to be our true balloon zombie counter, as its express purpose is to kill every balloon zombie on screen, and that's it. I mean, it also clears the fog, which... You know. Oh yeah, and I also forgot to mention that balloon zombies have an audio cue when they spawn, which is obviously pretty important when it comes to knowing when to use the blower. And with that, we easily dispatched the first few fog levels, got our hands on an incredibly valuable plant. That being said, I don't know what plant I just got. It could be the pumpkin, it could be the star fruit, it could be... You know what it can't be is the split pea. Yeah, I, I don't know what plant this is. <laughs> it could be a variety of things. And we moved right on into Vase Breaker. This minigame has two win conditions, break all the vases and kill all the zombies in all three of the stages. Although the contents of the vases in each stage are always the same, the positions are randomized, meaning we have to use context clues to figure out what's inside each one. So we're gonna have to take things a little slowly, one lane at a time. We can tell if a vase has a plant in it as opposed to a zombie by listening for this seed packet sound immediately after breaking it. And although there's never a way to immediately tell what exact plants are given, the fact that we can just take this level as quickly or as slowly as we want means that we have ample time to not only figure that out, but also generally analyze situations more accurately. For example, in this situation, I knew that I had two plants in this lane upon breaking this vase. I didn't hear a seed packet sound, so I knew a zombie spawned, and as soon as he took damage and made this noise, I knew it was a bucket head. Soon after, this noise happened, which indicated that one of my two plants was a snow pea, and the subsequent rate at which the bucket head was taking damage indicated that my other plant was either another snow pea or a pea shooter. Once once I gathered all that information, I determined that, yeah, a snow pea and a pea shooter should be able to take care of a buckethead, and so I patiently sat there until he died so I could do it all again. Of course, not every vase had this much thought behind it, but just generally taking things as slow as possible to absorb information and play it safe was absolutely the way to go throughout all three stages, allowing us to coast right on past Vase Breaker and back into the easy levels. But guys, watch out! 4-6 introduces yet another zombie type that we're gonna have to explicitly counter, but also has unique sound effects associated with them. Pretty dangerous stuff. I don't know. Much like with the cactus, it's just not worth it to spend a bunch of sun covering all my lanes with split peas just so that they can deal with a couple zombies and do basically nothing else. But unlike the cactus situation, I can't just leave it to my lawnmowers to deal with it this time, because that's not how digging zombies roll. So instead, I'm gonna have to get my own hands a little dirty and squash them. First, we just gotta listen for him, as he not only has a sound effect for digging under my defense, but also a sound for popping out of the ground. From there, I actually let him eat one of my sun shrooms before scanning my back line with the squash, and wherever I'm able to plant him must be where wherever he is. Got him. And it's just that easy. But that's really the last interesting development of this area, because the rest of the normal fog levels, 4, 7 through 4, 9, all look pretty dang similar, and it's all because of this plant right here. See, unlike the cactus and split pea, the star fruit is absolutely a plant that I'm willing to bench my fume shroom for. Although they're a little expensive and therefore slow to set up, these guys are just insane once they get going. They flood the screen with projectiles, which, again, just trust me on this one. They can shoot both diagonally and directly up or down, which means that we barely ever need to worry about the pool, and they can also shoot backwards just in in case any digging zombies or pogo zombies sneak past my guard. It's really a shame that we get these guys this late into the challenge, because they'd otherwise easily be top tier. Pumpkins and magnet shrooms may as well not exist in this challenge, because absolutely nothing about my strategy for these final fog levels needed to change, meaning we have yet another conveyor level to mow through before reaching the final area. And I found it quite fitting that even this level was easy. The main difficulty of this level comes from the fact that it's almost completely dark. And what's interesting about this is that the game throws less zombies at you than previous conveyor levels because it expects that darkness to be a hindrance, and it's trying to balance out the difficulty. Now this is incredibly funny for a variety of reasons, but more importantly, there is actually one really annoying thing about this level in particular, and that thing is balloon zombies. Much like the Zombonies in the last conveyor level, there's really no way for me to intentionally counter these guys, even when I know they're coming. So the only ways to deal with them is to get lucky and hit them with a blower when they spawn, get lucky and have a cactus on whichever lane they appear on, or get unlucky and burn a lawnmower. But this issue wasn't even close to keeping this absolute power line of a plants and the tiniest bit of partitioning from making a complete mockery of the easiest conveyor level thus far and propelling us straight onto the roof levels. So, as I briefly mentioned near the beginning of this challenge, the changes from area to area have actually generally been pretty good for us. Nighttime gave us access to our most powerful plants, the pool gave us easier flowcharts and partitioning strats, and the visibility limits in the fog levels indirectly lessened our load of zombies. The roof, however, 
sucks. Every single change is actively detrimental for us, and the first dang level took me an hour to beat. Here is my laundry list of issues with this first level and all the levels to come. Yeah, I'll try and make it quick. The roof incline means that we can't use any of our good plants, unless I put them all the way up here, which is way too risky when we can't see. So we're relying on the goddamn cabbage pole of all things to do damage. The fact that we have to plant flower pots also sucks, not only because we don't actually have it unlocked yet, so their death is permanent in this level, but it also means that shovel tapping is rendered almost completely useless. And there's now no easy way to tell the difference between a tile with a plant in it and a tile with just an empty flower pot. Oh yeah, and also, no lawnmowers. Instead, we gotta use roof cleaners, which are not only unavailable until after we beat the first level, but it's also just no longer a good idea to intentionally set them off for the sake of strategy, as doing so would mean sacrificing and later replacing all my flower pots on that lane, which is not a great idea. So this means no partitioning for the future conveyor level and even less coverage in our first zombie flowchart, which is now entirely reliant on completely random chance. And don't even get me started on the fact that all my mushrooms are sleeping again. What are you doing? None of the other plants need to sleep. Throw the tier list and first zombie flowchart in the garbage, cause we got a completely different meta to develop, which includes the new and unimproved and in fact straight up worse first zombie flowchart that involves putting a potato mine and squash on two random lanes and hoping the first zombie gets killed by one of them. But once I get past that first hurdle, I can put a cabbage pole and another set of boys on the other three lanes, making use of the fact that it's fairly unlikely for zombies to spawn on the same lane twice in a row. This setup, with some luck, should buy us enough time to deal with the first couple waves and set up an entire column of cabbage bolts, which which can then be further expanded to finally complete the first roof level. At this point, we can get our hands on roof cleaners. I'm on seed slots, this should have been pool cleaners, and this should be roof cleaners. And then, I may as well also get rakes for right now. Shut up, Crazy Dave, I'm trying to think. Rakes would make the beginning of levels easier. So I should have gotten roof cleaners and rakes and what is easily the more important upgrade, flower pots. These guys are not only necessary to get more plants on the board, especially since the number of starting flower pots is starting to dwindle, but they also provide two additional high level benefits. The first is pretty similar to a lily pad use, as it can help us find where we are in our plants if we try and plant in one of the right corners. And speaking of right corners, they also make for fairly cheap sacrifices, which increases our chances of making it past the first zombie by a significant margin and covers the one hole in our defense against the second zombie. This is also the level where I started to implement the sun flower hater formation, which I only started doing because I lost one too many attempts to pull vaulters eating my cabbage bolts. It's honestly super simple, it just involves putting cabbage bolts in my back line instead of sunflowers, which means they'll be the last thing that gets eaten if the lane gets overwhelmed. I would then slowly move the formation forward by placing new sunflowers even further up and replacing the ones in the back with more cabbage bolts. This strat worked fine for now, but it definitely had its flaws that we'll see later on. We eventually reached 5-3, which saw the introduction of the kernel pole, which immediately replaced the cabbage bolt in my lineup. Now on paper, these guys seem pretty terrible for us, as they do way less damage than cabbage bolts and may as well not even have a sound effect on hit. But their true utility comes in the form of butter, which, although entirely random, can stall zombies if we just get lucky enough. And I figured that if I was gonna use any kernels at all, then I may as well go all out in order to maximize my output of butter, which ended up being a pretty good strategy. In the next couple levels, we got the coffee bean, which I didn't have the courage to use yet, and the zen garden, which thankfully didn't require me to do anything. All was going fairly smoothly, all things considered, but that was until we ran into the worst first level in the entire challenge, 5-5. Five, five. Remember 3-5, a level that took me two hours to beat and a page and a half of writing to explain how I did it? Well, 5-5 five, five is a similar conveyor belt level and is kind of worse in every way. We get cherry bombs again, which were, you know, the most useless plants last time. Flower pots are sort of the analogs to lily pads, except this time it's like the entire board is a pool, which makes things pretty terrible. Pumpkins are actually technically better than walnuts, so that's an upgrade, but, you know, not by much. And instead of the pea shooters that allowed us to deal the consistent damage needed to clear out 3-5, this level gives us chompers, who uh, eat one, one zombie, uh, and then sit there for 40 seconds. All that alongside the fact that I can't do the partitioning strats that made 3-5 possible without throwing away all my flower pots, and we have the most impossible level thus far on our hands. And yeah, I beat a second try. Not gonna lie, don't know how this happened. I just used printer strats and I, I guess just got lucky. I had a whole plan cooked up that involved saving and quitting the game and intentionally dying to abuse how the continue function in this game works in order to implement some pseudo RNG manipulation. But I think the game just gave me a million chompers and let me win. Well, whatever works, cause we're moving on and not looking back. All right, so before we get into the last of the normal levels, let me just quickly get this out of the way. I don't care if any of them could have been good or whatever, I never used them. Instead, I continued to just go crazy with the kernels, which came with the additional development of no longer using the sunflower hater formation, as the new catapult zombies explicitly focus on the backline, almost as if the game knew the unfathomable power that the strategy held. 
It really didn't change anything, I'll be honest. I also started using the coffee bean so I could wake up doom shrooms for some of the big waves, which was a much better use of my seed slots than two random instants that I would never use. Especially considering that doom shrooms may be the only good counter when coming up against the last problematic zombie type in the entire game, Gargantuars. These guys are so dumb, they have enough health to withstand even instants, crush every plant they come across, and for some reason they also just have a little guy, just a little dude that he throws whenever he feels like it. Why does he do that? The only conceivable way to deal with these things blind is first listening out for this sound effect, which doesn't necessarily trigger when he spawns, but is rather a sound effect that randomly plays after he's already been spawned for a while. Uh, so that's cool. From there, I can place a Doom Shroom in the middle of the roof to at the very least get him down to half health. And yeah, that's the best I can do. And I never even ended up getting it to work. You wanna know what did work? All right, write this down. First, do your first zombie flowchart as per the usual and just happen to have one of your squashes not get used. Then build your board around the squash without ever getting rid of him, only to have the Gargantuar miraculously spawn in that exact lane and take enough damage from the kernels before getting squashed and dying. Wait a minute, he just died? Did I doom shroom? Or just use a roof cleaner, and also tends to work. And finally, as we reach the penultimate level of this challenge, I developed one more strategy to counter the gargantuars, and that was just to not have them spawn. Seriously, there was only one guy, and it was in the final wave with all my roof cleaners? I don't know how this happened. But with that, every single normal level in this game has been completed, with only one thing left to conquer. Dr. Zombos. This is the worst level in the game. And no, I'm not making a joke this time. This level is worse than 3-5. And you know what? It's not close. So many things work against us here, from the fact that it's a conveyor level to the necessity for specific plants at specific times and to the sheer quantity of insane zombies to deal with. It's absolutely infeasible to beat this level blind. I mean, it's technically possible, but you would just need to constantly get perfect luck throughout the entire 20 minutes it takes to complete this level. Swinging in the dark and praying is just too unlikely of a strategy to ever work. Forget partitioning, we'd need something huge to even have a chance to make it past this one. But in an uncharacteristic stroke of luck, that thing just might exist. This is Zomboss Manipulation. By setting off all but one of my roof cleaners, we can actually make use of the fact that they prevent zombies from spawning on those lanes for a couple waves. Because, here's the thing, this level doesn't really have normal waves, and zombies instead spawn one at a time when Zomboss puts them down. This tricks the game into never triggering the flag to re-allow zombies to spawn on those lanes, meaning we only have a single lane to deal with. This isn't just an instant win though, far from it in fact. There are plenty of things that hold this strategy back. Firstly, it's not bulletproof. If the roof cleaner on the one lane that we've chosen to keep ever gets activated, then all heck breaks loose, because the game's smart enough to avoid spawning literally zero zombies. But even if that never happens, having every single zombie spawn on the same lane isn't quite the boon you may expect it to be. For although I'll be putting all my focus on defending the lane, it's just infeasible to have enough pulse to deal with that many zombies. And the only good way to get through these attacks is by getting lucky enough and receiving a bunch of ice shrooms and especially jalapenos, who effectively act as a full screen wipe when we use this strategy. But even if we use this strategy and get really lucky, surviving the zombie attacks is really only half the battle, because we actually have a win condition to work towards this time around. Unlike every other level in this game, which all involves surviving a certain number of waves, this one requires us to mow through all 1,583 hit points of this guy's health while his head is down, which for reference, is a whole lot. This outlines yet another pretty big issue with Zomboss manipulation, and that's the fact that I just don't have very many plants out on the board, which means that I do next to no passive damage whenever he comes down to look at me. This issue is only amplified whenever he decides to be mean to me and destroy my entire lane with a fireball or ice ball, which I can only counter if I just so happen to have the plant I need in that exact moment. And putting plants in other lanes really isn't a viable strategy, for these are not only plants that I should probably be saving for the lane that'll actually have zombies, but I'm also pretty sure that doing this can sometimes break the Zomboss manipulation, which obviously isn't terribly beneficial. So if we can't rely on our automatic plans to deal damage to Zomboss to eventually kill him, then we're gonna have to do some manual damage with jalapenos, which means we're gonna have to learn this guy's phases, attacks, and associated sound effects if we want to make any sort of progress. So with all that information and preliminary strategizing out on the table, allow me to run through the cycle of steps that I took on my best attempt at this fight. I started the level by immediately decking out my top lane and then shoveling the flower pots on every other lane. I did this because the flower pots would otherwise stall the zombies, and if a rogue fireball happened to beat a zombie to a roof cleaner, then it would smash it rather than activate it, preventing zomboss manipulation from occurring. From there, I continue to put plants on my top lane, being sure to constantly cycle through them while mashing in order to avoid either trying to plant on an empty roof tile or trying to put a flower pot on another flower pot. I'd keep doing this until hearing this sound effect, which indicates that zomboss here has made his way down. This is a really dang easy sound cue to miss, as it's not only really faint compared to the rest of the game sounds, but the last sound is almost identical to the sound that plays whenever he places a zombie. 
But regardless, once he's down, I actually wait a bit in order to build up some planes on my conveyor. Like I've already mentioned, his next attack here can be devastating if he chooses my lane. But having a bunch of plants ready maximizes my chances of having the ice shroom or jalapeno we may need to save ourselves. Either way, this sound right here was my cue to attack with all I had, both to deal with any rampant orbs and potentially dealing big damage with some lucky jalapenos. Then I'd wait for him to stand back up, do an extra bonus attack for fun, and start placing zombies again before continuing to place as many plants as possible. And that was my cycle. And even though I had this whole strategy lined up with Zomboss manipulation and sound cues, this level still relied pretty heavily on luck. A great variety of things can and do go wrong on any of these cycles. Some were lucky, although most were not. But with enough time, perseverance, and trust in the strategy that I made for what turned out to be the hardest level in the entirety of this already insane challenge, something magical happened. Oh! Wait, 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 wait. That's it, that's it. Oh my gosh. Yes, oh my gosh. Oh, I thought that was a terrible attempt. <laughs> oh my gosh, there we go. Oh. Wow. <laughs> what? We did it, that's it. That's the entire game. The entire, the entire game <laughs> has been completed. Uh, blindfolded. But with that, yeah, that's it. I, my, my name's uh, Ben Sam. I don't know why you need to know that, but I thought you did. And uh, I still can't see you. <laughs> I can't actually see anything right now. And I can't see the game, but yeah, I still was able to complete it. And it's pretty cool, I think. So, would you look at that? <laughs> or, uh, I mean, you can look at that. I can't. Hey, welcome to the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed it, and if you did, there are several ways for you to let me know about it. Uh, my favorite, subscribing. Do that one first and foremost, but you can do the others if you want. I'm also here to remind you that my second channel exists. I'm gonna upload more there than just the raw footage of this challenge. I'm gonna upload raw footage of other challenges as well as other potentially edited videos. I'm not entirely sure yet. Uh, it's just gonna be a garbage dump channel as far as I'm concerned, but who knows, maybe I'll actually try and make a video on that channel at some point. But yeah, that point is not right now, I'm leaving, see ya.